Welcome everyone. Um, thank you all for being here in attendance today. This is the Wilderness Society's uh, Public Lands Curriculum Team's first installment in its summer, summer webinar series. For those of you who don't know or are unfamiliar with our curriculum, our public lands in the United States curriculum aims to build connections between people and America's natural landscapes. But beyond that, we want people to have a complete and accurate understanding of the history and context surrounding these places and the movement to protect public lands. We especially want to reinforce the knowledge that the public lands we love today were once indigenous lands and that the actions taken to conserve them have sometimes been exclusionary, insensitive, and engineered to benefit only a privileged few. Once we understand our public lands and their history, we can pay that knowledge forward into dialogue and policy decisions that are equitable and inclusive. This curriculum is available um, online and later we will be sharing a link that you can use to access uh, the landing page for the curriculum. It is publicly available free of charge and we encourage you to apply it however the information best supports your programs, roles, or your own personal um, learning goals. So with that in mind, I'm appreciating everyone putting their greetings and where they're from into the chat. Um, I will introduce our guest speaker today, Chloe, um, and then I'll allow her to go ahead and start her presentation. So Chloe is a Yale College of History and Art major, uh, sorry, Chloe is a Yale College History of Art major and Education Studies scholar as a leader of Yale's first year outdoor orientation trips program or foot, she has led week long hiking trips across New England to welcome incoming students. She actively contributed to foot's first public lands educational program based on the Wilderness Society's public lands curriculum. And her love for nature was born from family hiking trips as well as hands on experience conserving trails in the White Mount Mountains of New Hampshire with the Appalachian Mountain Club. Her other extracurricular activities include leading the Yale Women's Water Polo Club as club team as a captain, as well as creating and presenting over 45 public collections, highlighting tours since 2017 as a gallery guide at the Yale University Art Gallery. Lately, Chloe has been writing her art history thesis, which brings together her love for the arts and the environmental conservation advocacy. Her research centers on the 1971 anti-pollution print by George O'Keefe titled Save Our Planet, Save Our Air, which was part of the Save Our Planet, Save Our Air print uh, campaign or Save Our Planet campaign. And in her presentation today, Chloe will put O'Keefe and O'Keefe's Save Our Planet, Save Our Air print in conversation with the American environmental movement of the 1970s and the creation of Earth Day. It is our pleasure to introduce her today and have her speak on the aesthetic history of American envir environmental advocacy. And if there's one thing that Glass's research shows, it's that advocacy manifests itself in many shapes and forms. Before we get into the actual webinar, I would love to remind people to set their chat responses to all panelists and all attendees such that we can see it as panelists. Um, this is going to be an interactive webinar. As I understand, Chloe is going to have some things that she's going to ask you all throughout the presentation itself. And already we're seeing the greetings flow in, so keep it up. Um, with that being said, thank you, Chloe, for joining us and welcome. <laughs> thank you, Sharon, for that introduction. And thank you to the Wilderness Society for having me. I'm super excited. So I'm going to share my screen um, so that we can go ahead. All right. So as Sharon mentioned, I um, am a leader for Yale's first year outdoor orientation trips program, or FOOT. And this was how I came into contact with the Wilderness Society. Jamie Williams, the president of the Wilderness Society, spoke on the alum panel I organized last fall. And then I've begun this partnership with them this last year. Uh, I also, as Sharon said, have volunteered uh, conserving trails with the Appalachian Mountain Club in uh, New Hampshire in the White Mountains. So that's really how I got my start in uh, outdoor conservation and advocacy interest. And on campus, I worked as a gallery guide at the Yale Art Gallery, which is where I got to know O'Keeffe's work. So on the left hand side is a portrait of uh, her Bob Steerhead from 1936 that I've included on every single one of my highlights tours since the fall of 2017. And on the right hand side, I'm standing in front of her print, 
Save Our Planet, Save Our Air in the gallery's prints and drawings department, which I'll be speaking about um, with you all today. And this is, this is a larger image of the print. It, this print was actually a republishing of an earlier painting O'Keeffe created in 1963 called Sky Above Clouds 2. And while the series, the aerial landscape series is very well known, the, the print Save Our Air from 1971 is not. In fact, I'm one of the first to research this Save Our Planet, Save Our Air print and the larger Save Our Planet series from which it, in which it was published and placed Georgia O'Keeffe's work in the context of American environmentalism. So our conversation today will last between 20 and 30 minutes. And in order to make um, our discussion more interactive, as Sharon said, I'll be asking questions and I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts. So please make sure that your chat is set to all panelists and attendees so we can all see your observations. Before we begin, I'd also like to take a moment for a land acknowledgement. I'm speaking to you today from Yale's campus and what is now known as New Haven, Connecticut. So I would like to acknowledge that indigenous peoples and nations, including Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoak, Golden Hill Pagasset, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac and other Algonquin speaking peoples have stewarded through generations, the lands and waterways of, of what is now known as the state of Connecticut. I honor and respect the enduring relationships that exist between these peoples and nations and this land. And I also acknowledge that Yale is built on stolen indigenous land and with the labor of enslaved black and indigenous individuals. So I really encourage you all to find out whose lands you are on with the link that I've just put in the chat. Some other, um, I'd also like to set a few community agreements before we begin so that we can have the most generative conversation. First, remember that we speak in drafts. This means that you should feel free to offer your thoughts and insights even if you feel that they are not fully developed. Second, I ask that you draw from your own background and, and experiences and not just specific knowledge about the artworks or the subjects we'll be discussing. And finally, none of us know everything, but together we know a lot. So we will learn a lot together today and I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts. So this is the series Save Our Planet from which O'Keeffe's uh, work was included. It was uh, organized in 1971 by Mrs. Jean Lippman, a prominent American folk art collector and editor of the magazine Art in America, as well as the editor of publications at the Whitney Museum in New York. So this series pro promoted a message of ecological conservation through the works of six fine artists. So starting clockwise from the upper left-hand corner, Save Our Wildlife by Alexander Calder, Save Our Cities by Buckminster Fuller, then Save Our Wilderness with Edward Steichen's Tree, Save Our Air with O'Keeffe, of course, Save Our People with Ernest Trova, and finally Save Our Water with Roy Lichtenstein. And this is uh, Jean Littman presenting one of the posters to a director of, env of an environmental agency in New York City. So these are the four uh, campaigns that we will really be looking at today. 1971 was the beginning of the environmental awareness movement in America. In fact, the first ever Earth Day event occurred in 1970, and the organizer of Earth Day, Dennis Hayes, said that the event really brought environmentalism to the forefront of the public's mind. He remarked, quote, in late 1969, had you asked the question, what do you think about the environment? I think the most common response would have been, what is the environment? It just didn't have any kind of politi political connotation to it at all. By midway through 1970, something like 80% of Americans said that they were environmentalists, end quote. And these four conservation campaigns on the screen were really part of that growing vocabulary of environmentalism. Three of these examples uh, were in Littman's own archives. So she clearly drew lots of inspiration from the iconography of the time in order to create her Save Our Planet series. We will be comparing each of these four examples to the, uh, to the Save Our Planet series. And I want to emphasize that I'm not speaking for O'Keefe or any of the artists, but rather that together we will be using close looking skills to see similarities and differences across these media. So our first comparison really dives into the ad for the first ever Earth Day in 1970. Can, what visual differences do you all see between the ad on the left-hand side and O'Keeffe's Save Our Planet, Save Our Air print? Please put your observations in the chat. Mm. 
yeah, someone's noticing text versus image, white space, writing versus visuals, exactly. I think that's a really strong uh, first difference that we notice is that the ad is full of text. There's barely any kind of um, non-textual visual imagery. There's maybe that kind of bubble of cloud in the bottom right hand corner. Whereas O'Keeffe's print is really uh, primarily visual. There's barely any text. People are also noticing that there's uh, O'Keeffe's print is, is blue and pink, whereas the Earth Day ad is black and white. Um, and as well that the visual makes me think of the jellyfish overcrowding the sea, someone said. Yeah, that's a really interesting observation. In fact, I think you're kind of hitting the nail on the head is that O'Keeffe's work is so abstract that it was often misunderstood or misinterpreted as um, icebergs on a lake or jellyfish. I've never heard that one before and I, I love that um, kind of observation. I want to look specifically at the font and the typography that's employed here. So on the left hand side, we really have this heavy overbearing font, I'm circling, um, saying April 22nd period, Earth Day ad period. It's big, black and heavy and it kind of uh, weighs down the rest of, of the weighs down the rest of the page. Whereas on the right hand side, O'Keeffe's um, the, the slogan save our planet, save our air is positioned at the bottom of, of the page. So not only does our eye not go to it first, but it's also created with bubble letters. So the, the color visually it blends into the background. So it's almost invisible. Um, and yes, Lori's noticing O'Keeffe's piece doesn't include specifics. Great, great uh, observation. Uh, O'Keeffe's piece just says, we have to save our planet. The work isn't telling us how we should save it, why we should save it, even when we should save it, compared to the Earth Day ad, which is really um, making very clear what kind of community action needs to be taken. Not only do they need money, but they also need communities to come together. College campuses are coming together. They mentioned they name drop specific senators uh, who are really pushing for conservation bills. So the Earth Day ad is much clearer in its intent, whereas the um, Save Our Air print is much more ambiguous and open-ended. In fact, I think that's really, this uh, comparison is really highlighted by the fact that the font used for Save Our Air is similar to the Star Wars font. So 1970 was really, um, a science, the sci-fi genre was really um, exploding in the 1970s. And while Star Wars was not, did not open until 1977, six years later, there's this kind of similar dystopian fantastical font. Um, and in the 1970s, as people are becoming enamored with sci-fi, they're really turning their attention upwards and outwards, um, which Littman has astutely recognized and uses that same type of font to signify um, a message of saving our air, the air around the planet, the atmosphere. At the same time, uh, I think it's kind of odd that she employs this text of this, this typography that really is associated with sci-fi and fantastical, dystopian, unfortunately, if you're a Star Wars fan, uh, imagined worlds when she's trying to communicate an urgent message of anti-pollution action. Um, and another comparison that we can make is to this contemporary poster from 2019 by the artist Holly St. Clair for an art climate exhibition. Holly St. Clair is also using bubble letters, but in, but the, the color and the placement on the page are very different from O'Keeffe's. First of all, she places it in the center of the page. So it's it draws our, we're, our, our eye is drawn to it immediately and the bright pink contrasts against the, the green of the background. So it's easily legible. While the font, uh, well, the composition might be different. However, both artists, both Holly St. Clair and Georgia O'Keeffe are using this collective signifier, this, the pronoun of we, we must save our air, shall we clear our, the air, um, save our planet. Um, so there's still this call to collective action. And Judy is noticing, uh, I think O'Keeffe was just trying to make it airy, which I assume is talking about kind of the font. Exactly, that's, that's another great observation, the font, 
uh, the typography of save our planet, save our air is made in the same way that the clouds are. The clouds are also negative space, kind of white space enclosed by the, the, by the blue of the sky and the save our air typography are also literal, literally just empty bubbles. Um, yes, the, the, these two posters here on the screen are whimsical while the Earth Day ad is serious. I think that's also getting to kind of to the emotional core of these posters. Um, the font and the typography and the placement really emphasizes the, the kind of urgency and emotions that the artists are communicating. For our second comparison, I really want us to look at this um, image, which illustrated an article published by the Wilderness Society in 1970, which described America's public landmarks and asked people to financially contribute to the organization's um, advocacy efforts. So what are you seeing in this image? Um, people looking at a moose. Yes, there's um, these four people were uh, looking at looking at an animal. Liz is saying, "I feel like I'm there." That's a great point. Yeah, we we kind of feel like a fifth person in this um, in this encounter. The photographer has literally given has literally showed us the grass on which they are standing. So by extension, we as a viewer can, can imagine where we're putting our feet and how we're situating our body in this composition. So we feel like a fifth person looking out at this moose. Um, someone else is saying the moose is turned towards us, not the people. We don't see their faces. Yeah, we are having this kind of personal interaction with wildlife um, rather than focusing on the faces and the identities of the people around us. Someone else is saying 300 feet from wild animal. Yeah, this, we definitely wouldn't be able to get this close today. So uh, this image kind of dates itself, not only the proximity of the human to the animal, but also the sepia black and white tones. We can tell this is an image from the 1970s. Um, people are developing a respect for nature, uh, family and nature absorbed. Um, outside or proximity with nature, awe. Yeah, these are all these we're getting very intimate kind of emotions here as it, because we are entering into kind of this emotional interaction with the animal. By comparison, I want us to look at this uh, Alexander Calder Save Our Wildlife print from the Save Our Planet series. What differences do you notice? Uh, animals calling out for help, perspective of nature, abstract interpretation, no people. Yeah, these are, I think you're, these are the big visual differences that we can see right off the bat. The fact that this is a fantastical animal. It's kind of an amalgamation of a snake and also a frog with the bulging eyes and maybe some type of cat with the ears and the mouth. I've certainly never seen an animal like this. I don't know if I want to. Um, so it's a fantastical creature that's uh, someone saying dragon exactly it almost looks like a dragon that's floating in that's floating in space we don't know we, we have no kind of context for the background um, we can't put ourselves physically next to this animal it's a lot harder to um, enter into this image than perhaps it is with the wilderness society image of the moose other other people are saying crying out an alarm yeah, we have the speech bubble saying, save our planet, save our wildlife, literally emerging from the mouth of the animal. And I'm curious if you all had to choose between one of these two to illustrate a message of wildlife conservation, which might you choose? People are saying the Calder, Calder. One vote for the moose picture. Yeah, there's this kind of urgency with the uh, Calder, in fact, and I think it's very interesting that you all are naming, are, are saying Calder, not the photo, not the drawing with the snake or the dragon. In fact, Littman herself received a postcard from someone who had seen an exhibition of the Save Our Planet series in London, 
and he wrote to her saying, I really love the exhibition. Please send me a, a, the Calder print. He didn't say, please send me the snake print. He said, please send me the print by Alexander Calder. And this really highlights the fact that Littman is leveraging the fame of these six American artists to promote this message of ecological conservation. By 1971, Calder was one of the most famous American artists and sculptors. And this drawing was very, uh, was very reminiscent and recognizable of his style. And so, um, and similarly, O'Keeffe by 1971 was also extremely well known. Her aerial landscapes at this point, she had completed four of them by 1965, um, were, were, were all very well known. Here she is standing in front of Sky Above Clouds 2, which is the work that the print uh, is, is based off of in her home in New Mexico. But you've most likely seen variations on her series of clouds or perhaps Sky Above Clouds 4 itself at the Art Institute of Chicago. This is her biggest work ever, eight feet tall by uh, 24 feet uh, long. And so even if you haven't seen her aerial landscape, she's her, her kind of abstract uh, landscapes of the desert and bones in the sky are, are typically her style. So the clouds would have been very recognizable. This is our third uh, comparison I really want us to look at, which is uh, Save Our Cities, Soil, Water, Air campaign from 1970. I actually saw it at the Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum in Connecticut in March, which was uh, really exciting. So I'm hoping we can look closer at this together. So this is a Save Our Cities stamp on the left-hand side and Buckminster Fuller's um, Save Our Cities print on or print on the right hand side and what differences and similar what similarities are you noticing uh, the dome someone said in all caps with an exclamation point exactly there is this repetition of domes with the playground that the children are climbing on and the dome over manhattan Someone saying a geodesic dome, exactly. That is really reminiscent of Buckminster Fuller's style. He was an architect and would often include these domes over his uh, plans of buildings and cities. A view of the planet from above. Someone else is saying on the left-hand side, we have an image of the earth as a whole. And here we have a bird's eye view of Manhattan. And again, that difference in kind of color here the stamps are the are the is the image that is colored versus the print is um, is published in black and white there's also this kind of two-part slogan uh, for the stamps we have a representation of the earth and then the cities save our and and then that two-part slogan is again repeated in the print save our planet up above with save our cities um, typed down below in fact the typography even looks the same it's this kind of a squat, bold font that really borders the image in, in both of these examples. And this really points to uh, another one of Littman's, um, another way that Littman was very astute in creating the Save Our Planet series. She had this, she, she knew about this stamp collection. She actually wrote to the Postmaster General in 1970 inquiring about them and who who made them, how they were produced, where she could acquire them. And then a year later, she's hired, uh, or she's, she's asked Buckminster Fuller to represent the Save Our Planet, Save Our Cities um, slogan with his recognizable geodesic dome over Manhattan. So essentially Littman is not reinventing the wheel of uh, environmental vocabulary. She knows that the stamp campaign, campaign is, is very popular, very well known among the American public. And she reuses not only the visual iconography of the domes, but also that two-part slogan of saving the planet and saving the cities. So, uh, yeah. And I'd like us to look at uh, the Buckminster Fuller's 1971 print compared to this 2019 poster that illustrates the Green New Deal. Uh, I think the what probably jumps out to everyone here is the fact that there's also a dome 
over Manhattan, except in this case, it's a dome of trees. So literally breathing new life into the city. And um, again, it's blue and green here. So communicating kind of that message of hope and rejuvenation. Yes, Judy saying, wow, so similar, exactly. Um, I found this, the Green New Deal poster image in randomly in, in, a, in a book I had and just kind of stopped in awe because it is so similar to Buckminster Fuller's example. Our fourth comparison is really with um, this this series from uh, 1970 called Dirty Pictures, which was a contest organized by Psycholo Psychology Today that asked Americans to send in submissions um, expressing their anxieties and worries about um, pollution and art. And the judges actually received so many, so many submissions that they had to hire, uh, they had to rent out a new warehouse in order to display everything. And interestingly, these, while fine artists did send in paintings and photographs, the majority of the work sent in were by regular Americans. So school teachers, uh, families, children, really anyone and everyone sent in anything and everything. Not only were there um, paintings, but also people sent in literal ephemera. So kind of, and also like bits of trash, but also video and audio recordings. Um, and I want us to take a closer look at these because I think it really exemplifies the, the public attitude around pollution in the 1970s. So here, what are you seeing in these four images? Poison, not hopeful. Yeah, death, we're getting a lot of negative words, fear, pain, um, melting, brutal. Yeah, there's definitely a, a very clear shift in tone here from the uh, from O'Keefe's poster to this dirty pictures imagery, literally dirty pictures, um, gasping for breath. Yeah, I think this, the, the image with the oxygen bottle in the um, in the lunchbox is really striking, um, suggesting that oxygen, you know, clean air has become so rare that we need to bottle it and buy it and send children to school with it as if, as if it's a necessity like sandwiches or apples or the composition notebook. Um, other people are saying it feels very dystopian. I see something that says like Wally, -E, the movie. Um, yeah, a very different feel compared to O'Keeffe's O'Keeffe's print, which really presents this message of hope. You know, we have the pink colors bleeding over the horizon line in the background. So as though it's a um, sun rising over, over the horizon, a new day dawning compared to the dirty pictures imagery, which are literally a black background. So as though night is setting and, and there's kind of darkness consuming everything. And again, this, this image, this imagery of hope was very intentional on the part of Littman who chose O'Keefe to represent Save Our Air. The Save Our Planet series was actually uh, given to members of the United Nations with the intention that they be hung in the nation's embassies. And so Littman is recognizing that while she can implore politicians and foreign politicians to act um, on the behalf of anti-pollution uh, legislation, she can't really tell them, she, she can't tell them how to do it, when to do it, or why to do it. So that's why I think this open, literally empty vessel of the typography at the bottom that we connected to um, being an empty vessel that can be filled with whatever type of message, um, I think that's really why Littman chose this typography. And also the fact that she's leveraging famous American artists. So even here, the, the slogan is literally displaced to make room for O'Keeffe's signature and the, the image is literally um, put above the slogan. So focusing on the, uh, Im the artist instead of uh, the, the, the slogan perhaps. So 
So, and people are still noticing different ways that they're interpreting O'Keeffe's uh, work, which is really interesting. So today we've really looked at um, Save Our Planet series and O'Keeffe's print in particular, and um, we have put them really in the context of the blossoming American environmental movement of the early 70s. And we've seen how some themes, visual themes have really stayed the same across media and time periods. Um, but what is unique to the Save Our Planet series is that Lippmann is really leveraging the fame of the artists uh, and, and their recognizable works. And she's really creating this kind of language of diplomacy and this international act of um, cultural persuasion around anti-pollution efforts. So I really want to thank you all for looking closely with me together, um, looking closely with me at these works of art today. Hopefully, we've, as we've moved from the 1970s to the present, you've gotten a sense of how uh, advocacy can be communicated through different media and, um, and different uh, iconographies. So thank you for looking closely with me. And Ahad will drop uh, some links in the chat that you can click on to learn more about um, these works of art. Yeah, thank you, Ahad. All right. <clears throat> thank you for that presentation. And thank you, Ahad, for um, facilitating with the link so people can look up some of these images for themselves if they would like to do a deep dive or just look more into um, each of these artists' portfolios. Um, with that being said, we'll start with our Q&A and then we'll move on to the audience Q&A. So um, if there are questions that you ha all have and you haven't put them into the chat, please feel free to put them in. Um, and hopefully we will try to get to as many as we can. I cannot promise I will get to everything, but feel free to keep them in the chat and we'll save them. Um, so let's start with question number one. What initiated your interest in the outdoors, Chloe? Yeah, that's a great question. So I have really had the privilege of growing up in a family where we had financial and physical access to the outdoors and my parents really prioritized outdoor activities. So the thing that I remember first is in fourth grade, I was studying Wyoming for a states project, um, which was uh, learned a lot about Wyoming. I think it's the first state to give women the right to vote. So very cool. But more than that, we went to Wyoming the summer after and I remember hiking in Yellowstone and just seeing the bison around me and luckily no bears from close up, but uh, the bison and the elk and the other animals and just kind of just being stopped in awe. I think I, in fourth grade, you're like 12 years old, um, but it is, I don't know, but it's just a moment that's really struck with me where I was having kind of a just a connection to nature, just standing there and just being a part of it. And so that's really something that I've tried to um, make a part of my life. So in high school for three summers, I volunteered with the Appalachian Mountain Club, which is more on the side of uh, conservation and advocacy. So we would go out for a couple of weeks at a time, literally moving, digging up rocks and moving them and making trails so that people could um, more easily hike on the trails and also we would be preventing erosion. Um, so if you ever hike on uh, those rock steps or log steps, uh, just know that five feet of that takes like a week of 10 people working together. Um, and then at Yale, I immediately applied to become a foot leader because I think being in the outdoors with people, you not only have a connection to nature, but you also really are able to connect with each other better. So not having your phones for a week and just getting to know each other over, you know, a bowl of pasta and um, and and just kind of having that experience together um, is something that I've really tried to actively make a part of my life. So uh, yeah, Yellowstone. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. I feel like for a lot of people, myself included, it's just, yeah, being arrested by the natural beauty that you're like, well, this has to stay. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. You're like, <laughs> We have to like I want other people to be able to like have this experience of just like awe and just breathing in deeply and just, just yeah just awe. yeah um 
my next question for you. Um, obviously, you've pointed out your interest in both arts and art history, as well as outdoor education. Um, how did you begin to think that those two interests could intersect or be related at all? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for me, I think art really, you know, art doesn't exist in a vacuum, never. And so um, I realized this, especially on, I'm going to start sharing my screen again quickly because I really want to, oops, because, um, Yes, yeah, so this was uh, this is one of the paintings that I include on my highlights tour at the art gallery. It's a still life from uh, 1620, so a, a, a while ago. And at first glance, you might think, oh, it's just a still life, like flowers in a vase. Cool. But actually, upon researching this, I found that none of these flowers bloom at the same time together. And a lot of them also aren't, you know, Italian, where the artist is from, or Slicaccia. And so I dug a little bit deeper and I found her father was, in, was uh, involved in trade. And so he had books uh, that compiled uh, botanical illustrations of flowers. And so, and Katya was also the head of a convent. So maybe she, you know, has planted some of these flowers in her own backyard and is picking them and, and creating um, paintings of them, paintings from them. And so you realize that, you know, artists are using what's around in their own land and around them. And there's also this great example of this still life also at the Yale Art Gallery that I include on my tours from 1816, Raphael Peel painting this in Philadelphia. And while we might think of peaches as, you know, a typical summer fall fruit in the Northeast now, in 1816, they really weren't. And so he only had access to these peaches because a greenhouse had been built and which allowed fruits and vegetables and plants that weren't native or at either in that location or at a specific time of year to be grown. And so you're, um, you're really realizing that artists are already intertwined with the environment around them. Um, so this really, really, really stuck with me. And going to stop. Also, one of the things that has been formative for me is um, we visited, there's, there's an outdoor sculpture garden in New York called Storm King. And they have works of art um, by artists such as Maya Lin, who's a Yale graduate, and she makes the wave fields, which I had a photo, and um, Andy Goldsworthy, who creates um, sculptures that look like the classic stone walls of New England, but kind of undulating through a field. And so you're looking at that and you're realizing, oh, that the works, works don't need to be in a museum or don't need to be framed in order to be considered art, which I think is, um, which is really powerful and also a point of accessibility like you don't need to enter into a building in order to see um, art um, and <laughs> the fact that a lot of my peers are actually um, science majors and you might think oh like what what does art history have to bring to science but the, the close looking that we all use today and a lot of you might not be art history majors but just by taking a second to slow down and just spend a few seconds a minute with a work of art you create kind of an emotional attachment to it and you're able to see details that you might not have had you just passed on after five seconds. And so that close looking skill is really applicable to anything, but especially to, I think, science and to um, uh, discussions about the environment where you need to look closely in order to come up with conclusions. Mm. Um. In your position, like in this intersection, are there some surprising things you've learned about yourself um, being both like a gallery guide, environmental educator, thinking about um, the social aspects, um, as well as some of these scientific aspects of ad advocacy? I think one of the biggest ones is really learning to be flexible. Um, like even today in the chat, I kept seeing um, comments that I hadn't thought of before <laughs> about these works of art that just, you know, take my um, brain and thoughts in a whole new direction. So really being open, I think, to those different uh, points of view and ideas in, in um, researching or just having a conversation about works. And also like, yeah, I never would have really expected, if you had told me four years ago I was going to be writing my art history thesis on like cultural diplomacy, politics, which I didn't really talk about today, but politics and American environmentalism, I wouldn't have really known what to say. And I think that's another thing that I've learned is really like 
really being open to thinking outside the box and creating those connections. Like if you just contain yourself to a box from the get go, you're not really going to to um, have, you're not really going to go anywhere. Hmm. Um, I guess along that same lines, what words of advice would you give to other young people or just other people generally who think that they may not have the proper skill set or background to be an advocate or an educator, um, either whether it's about the environment or just any other topics that they feel passionate about? Yeah, I think the first thing is really, I think the big thing is experience. Like find, find something that interests you um, and engage in that and then explore that through experience. Or if you don't have anything that interests you, that's totally fine. And in that case, like ha ex expose yourself to a bunch of different experiences so you can see what clicks with you, who clicks with you in certain uh, subjects and fields. Um, just kind of, again, being flexible and being open to experiencing this before, before you find kind of your rhythm and what, what interests you. And like no one starts off with the perfect set of skills. Also that comes from practice and experience. Um, like I, I, being, being a gallery guide has really taught me how to engage with people, but also how to have lead public discussions, which I might not have done before. So just by engaging in that practice. Um, and there's also no right background to come from. I, the, the strongest group of people I think are people who come from a range of backgrounds and experiences. Like this fall when I led the um, public lands curriculum for foot, we would have discussions and our footies, or the students who are part of foot come from across the country, internationally even from very, very different backgrounds. And so you have people um, talking about their own interaction with public lands and their communities that um, others have never experienced. And so there's um, just more communication and understanding that happens when you have people um, who, who come from different backgrounds, I think. So yeah, be open, be open to, uh, I know that sounds cliche, but be open to opportunities and, and put yourself out there if you can. I'm gonna ask a couple more of my questions then we'll, we'll switch over to um, audience questions. Um, but switching from things more about you to things more about the art history itself, um, in the, or kind of thinking of the original aesthetics of the environmental campaigns and some of the things that you walked us through today, what do you think is going to be the future of environmental art? A move towards or possibly away from dystopianism? What sort of like imagery, surrealist, the brightness, the darkness, et cetera? Some more things that are Star Wars inspired. Um, and of course, this just in your in your own thinking and based on your own knowledge and doing research what do you think is the future of environmental um the first thing that comes to mind is that image i think we've probably all seen of the polar bear on that melting ice cap so i think that was definitely the tone of imagery when maybe five years ago and it definitely there is still um environmental imagery that is very urgent and kind of arresting and painful to look at like that. But I think there's also, um, um, I think the mood of conservation has really turned a little bit more positive. The Green New Deal posters that I just showed, the shall we clear the air and the image of Manhattan with trees, I think really exemplify that where we're imagining a world where, you know, we put in place climate change policies and we're really um, being careful about what we're doing and suddenly the world's kind of reflourishing. And there's also, I remember with the save with the straws movement, there's kind of a save the turtles. So again, like having that imagery of, of saving the turtles and being able to swim in an ocean where there are lots of, um, where there is abundant wildlife. Unfortunately though, um, I feel like at this moment in time, there are a lot of politicians just seem to be resistant to climate change policies, no matter what we put out there. So like, there's an organization that a friend from high school started called This Is Zero Hour. And they really, they create movements and rallies where talking urgently about climate change. And uh, so there's, I think there's a balance here, but it's turning more towards kind of desperate hopeful. Like we're running out of time and, and this is what we need to do. Mm. 
Um, let's turn to some audience questions now. Um, Michael asked previously, do you know if O'Keefe had total control over the creation of the poster? Could there be a designer or typographer who collaborated with O'Keefe? And could there have been an art director or publisher who might have had major input on the finished product? Great question. I asked myself the same questions. Uh, so 1971, O'Keefe is already pretty, she's very well known, but she's also pretty old at that point. She dies in 1986, close to the age of 100. And so the poster Save Our Planet, Save Our Air is a republishing, really a reuse of an earlier painting she had made in 1963. So on that, on that note, she's you know, created the composition. The type, the question about type, typography and who designed it or who collaborated with O'Keefe is um, a great question. I think it was probably um, Lippmann who had an idea of the type of font she wanted each poster to use. Um, unfortunately, there aren't very many uh, accessible archives, especially, especially virtually that I've been able to access. So luckily, and thankfully, the, the Smithsonian American Art Museum has really scanned all of Lippmann's files for me, which I've kind of um, gone through, poured over. Um, but in terms of typographer that collaborated, that's a great question. We know that O'Keefe collaborated with Harold Hugo in a president of the Meriden Gravier Company in Connecticut who produced a few of her works on paper. Um, but whether he or someone else created the typography is, is a good question. Okay. Oh, yeah, I guess everyone's wondering. Um, one question from the audience. Do you have any books that you would recommend, Chloe, that you feel informed your overall practice with environmental art? And kind of in the same vein, maybe if there are any artists whose works maybe you would recommend yeah. to people to look at. Great question. Um, the text that comes to mind first is um, from an art exhibition at the Yale Art Gallery put on in collaboration with other institutions at Yale. And it was the first ever exhibition of indigenous art called Place, Nations, Generations, Beings, 200 Years of Indigenous North American Art. And the curators really talk about not only the history of indigenous art, but also the history of uh, wilderness and um, racialized ideas of wilderness that are pervasive to this day and how it's represented in art. Unfortunately, that um, exhibition essay is not available online, but um, there are other essays like it that, you know, that, that sum up kind of that ideal, uh, that idea. In terms of artists, uh, Maya Lin is really an artist um, whose work is is really inspiring. I think she's also uh, an environmental activist, but most of you probably know her for her Vietnam Veterans Memorial, um, which she created while she was still a student at Yale, so no pressure. Um, but and she's also the creator of the Wave Field that Storm King. And now uh, in her career, she started a, a collaboration with other artists called What is Missing that really invites people to bear witness to the ongoing extinction of species due to man's um, involvement in in uh, in pollution, and so her work uh, is really explicitly um, attuned towards the environmental, which which I really which I really enjoy. Um, but I would really I would I would encourage people just to seek out um, different artists and writers, even. Yeah, even uh, people, you know, follow social media accounts that present a different perspective, per, per, follow artists, support their works. Um, yeah, I maybe in the in the post in the email that Sharon will send out after I can include some links to readings and artists whose works I, I really enjoy that I would recommend. Um, That's a great idea. Um got this question, very interesting question from Betsy Stark. 
protests generate some incredible sign art. Are these images documented as art? And it also made me think this question, thank you for the question, Betsy. It made me think of um, Greta Thornburg's um, school strike poster and protests around the world create such impactful imagery, but how do those, do you think, speak to the art war, like things that are categorized as art generally, whereas things that are categorized as protest and what overlap exists there? Yeah. Um, I think photographs of those presentations, of those protests are probably like, those are definitely included in probably exhibitions. And I feel like we've seen those images with the Women's March from, a, from four years ago now. Um, and those signs as well, especially signs that you know, represent such a watershed moment and, um, and voice, if they're not included in museums, I think they should definitely, they definitely should be, they're so important um, and should be um, like kind of preserved in some way to make that um, moment in history accessible to future generations. I don't know whether museums are doing that or um, if Greta Thornburg's was specifically, but um, yeah. Okay, sorting through some more audience questions. Um, one question about George O'Keefe. Do you know if George O'Keefe participated in any other environmental advocacy product, projects? And to what extent do you know if she really believed in the this movement or um, were were these images some things that she came up with independently? How much were were was it because she was commissioned? Um, and similarly, what other environmental advocacy projects did she participate in? Do you know? Yeah. She was a pretty private person. So it's been um, she didn't really publicly associate herself with uh, many things, but she sent, she would send kind of out of the blue donations of huge amounts of money to do environmental organizations. Um, and so in one instance, I think she sends them $25,000 and they write back, they're like, wow, we didn't know you knew of us or, or supported us. Thank you so much. We will put this to the best use. Um, what is really well known about O'Keefe is her circle of uh, friends and colleagues and what activities she engaged in with them. So especially with the photographer, Tom Webb, whose photos I have included in the PowerPoint, they raft down the Grand Canyon or down to Colorado to get together multiple times. And, and there are pictures of her kind of standing in the middle of the canyon with her sketchbook drawing the clouds or drawing the stones. And so she was very aware and, and in love with the landscape around her. She, um, began to make these aerial landscapes because she took a plane for the first time uh, over New Mexico and was just enamored with the sky that she saw. And she was also very aware of the efforts um, to destroy the climate around her. The uranium mining was happening not too far away in the Southwest. She lived in New Mexico. And there were also the atomic bomb tests happening in, in New Mexico. And during World War II, her imagery becomes much, much darker. Her landscapes literally turn black and, and there's lightning strikes and roiling clouds and a lot of shadows. And she writes that she's just kind of overwhelmed and that there's, there's so much destruction happening around her because for her, the planes, she was able to see the world from a different perspective from planes but at the same time, they're also used as weapons of war. So there's that dichotomy going on as well. Um, she actually built a bomb shelter beneath her bed, apparently I've heard, um, because she was just so kind of frightened by what was happening around her. So while she might not have publicly kind of associated herself with certain organizations, she certainly was very aware of it. She also had many copies in her personal library about American environmentalism and the climate. I think she has a cookbook about um, ways to save the planet. Um, so uh, she's, she doesn't have her head in the sand while she might not publicly um, talk, talk about it. Yeah. Hmm. Um, maybe this will be our last question. Um, some people are generally asking about the, the, 
the time frame of the 70s, 80s, do you notice a difference in environmental type art in the 80s when society was leaning towards being materialistic? And I'm gonna combine these two questions so we can kind of address them both. It's interesting how in the 1980s, a large topic with the environment was saving the ozone layer. Then in the 90s, it was preserving the forest or rainforest. Now it has been climate change for quite some time. I wonder if art from those decades reflects those topics. Yeah, um, I can say that, well, I wasn't alive. Uh, obviously, my one of my art history professors, Professor Cook, uh, told me that he not only had O'Keeffe's posters or O'Keeffe's poster and the other Save Our Planet series posters in his dorm room, but that he remembers having uh, lots of visual imagery around acid rain which I didn't remember at all. For me growing up, it was really, you know, the melting ice caps. And so I think, yeah, each art from different decades will really, um, will really emulate kind of the anxieties that people are having. The Save Our Planet series is unique, especially in 1971, because that was when a lot of the climate change and conservation policies were being enacted in the US. So you have like the Clean, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, um, Endangered Species Act kind of all around that time. And before the 70s, conservation was really divided into specific groups. You had apparently Audubon who only, you know, they only did birds. They didn't really, um, Dennis Hayes, the organizer of Earth Day was really making this clear saying some groups explicitly talked about aerial wildlife, but not air conservation or not water pollution. And so the 70s, you see these, you see organizers and, and activists really bringing those threads together and creating a cohesive whole, which I think is really what the Save Our Planet series exemplifies. It's taking these six different aspects of the environment and putting it together in a single um, series, which again was given to the United Nations uh, to, to really emphasize that message of conservation. So that's, yeah, that's a great question. Um, since we only have a couple minutes left, I would love to give a little bit of this time here if there's anything that you would like to plug, um, if there's anywhere that you would like people to follow your work or anything like that. Sure, I'll put my, I have a public Instagram. So if you all have questions or want to see more of kind of these interdisciplinary connections. That's where I post uh, a lot of my thoughts as a, an art history student and gallery guide. And uh, I will add some recommended reading and artists to to follow and to support on um, in the email that Sharon will send out. So hopefully if you all keep an eye out for that, that will give you a better idea of um, how you can continue and, and educate yourself if you would like. All right. Well, I would love to thank you once again for giving us a little bit of your evening. Um, this has been very informative. Of course, the process of working with you generally has been very informative as a non-artist. Um, and it's really, it's always great to, to get immersed into something that you don't usually get into, but is always interesting. So once again, thank you, Chloe, for your time and being an educational resource. Um, lastly, for the audience members, I just want to encourage you again to, if I can make this bigger, here we go. If you have not interacted with the Wilderness Society's public lands curriculum before, and you would like to learn more, as I stated in the beginning, it is a free resource that um, documents the history of public lands, especially with an eye towards um, the history of indigenous occupation of this land and um, the conversion of that into things like the national park system and the public lands as we use and enjoy them today. I highly encourage all of you to use the link that Ahad just dropped in the chat to learn more about the Wilderness Society and the public lands curriculum. And once again, thank you all for your time and for joining us this evening. Bye, Bye everyone. <laughs>